But I think a lot of this stuff comes down to maybe this kind of idea of luxury beliefs. You know, the student union at Sydney can can say these things because the, the consequences of their their beliefs have no impact upon those expounding those beliefs. Professor Doug Stokes is professor of international relations, director of the Centre for Advanced International Studies, and college director of commercial engagement at the University of Exeter in the UK. Prior to his career as an academic, he had many jobs. It included interesting things like establishing a non-government organisation in Bosnia dedicated towards ethnic reconciliation in the early 2000s, and the completion of a PhD, and since then, numerous books and articles on United States foreign policy, the global politics of energy, and the challenge of China. Recently, Doug's been engaged in the very important broader cultural debate regarding the state of universities in Western countries, and also the decline of a sense of civilizational purpose in America and in Britain. Very relevant, I think, for Australia as well, as we grapple with the internal pressures we now face in as a nation, coinciding with a very destabilised and very dangerous global outlook. Well, Doug, welcome. I'm really glad that you've come on, and I really hope that a lot of Australians in particular listen to what you have to say. Uh, you probably don't, have known, had much of an audience in this country yet, but what you have to say about the two things that are really important for Australia's future, the first is the substantial altering of global architecture that's taking place at the moment, and you write very extensively on that. The second is the loss of belief in ourselves, even a sort of a, a self-loathing that's emerging, which means, as our education minister said recently in Australia, one wonders whether young people would feel they'd even want to fight for our culture because it's been sold to them as such a terrible thing. These are very live issues for Australia, and made even more so because as an ally of America and of Britain's, that's been reflected in the recent AUKUS deal, of course. Um, we are, as it happens, the smallest uh, and the most far-flung and the closest to where trouble may be. So what you have to say will be extremely interesting to a lot of people, certainly to me. Uh, but I'd like to begin on a personal note. After you finished your initial stint at university as a student, you actually worked as a war journalist in that very troubled part of the world at the time, Bosnia. And as I understand it, you had a couple of pretty nasty, life-threatening moments, which are, for anybody, very sobering. Can I ask about that, or the impact of those on you, and how they've given you, have they given you this sort of deep sense of, you know, we've got to try and avoid conflict and violence and, and find better ways to do things? Well... First, I'd like to say, John, thank you so much for having me on this podcast. I think it's, I think this is, I think now Australia's leading podcast. And so it's an absolute honor to be here and to be with the audience. So thank you so much for inviting me on. Um, it, it, the interesting thing about Bosnia is obviously I, I spent, I went to Bosnia in just about a year or so after the war ended. Um, and I went, first I was in, uh, I went to a place called Mostar, which is a really interesting place, um, because you had the, um, it was surrounded by Bosnian Serb forces and was pounded into submission with more heavy mortar fire. And then the Federation managed to push the Serbs out, but the Federation was composed of Bosnian Muslims and Bosnian Croats. And then that Federation in Mostar collapsed into into C9 warfare between ostensible, ostensible allies. So that was a really interesting experience. And then I went from there to a place called Brishko, which is in northern Bosnia. Prior to the war, it was very mixed. Uh, after the war, it was a, the place I lived at least was 100% Serbs, so extraordinarily high levels of ethnic cleansing. But given the territorial dispensation at the end of the war, Brichko was essentially a five kilometer uh, corridor that joined the two halves of Republic of Srpska. And it's back in the news as we speak because um, it's uh, it's a really hot spot in terms of because it's a, it's a land corridor between the, the two halves of Republic of Serbska, where the, you know the, the Bosnian Serbs live, 
And so therefore, it's been under international arbitration. The, the, the Serbs don't want to lose it. Uh, the, the Bosnian Serbs don't want to lose it. But obviously, they, they, they have it as a result of, you know, the, the sort of very heavy ethnic, ethnic cleansing. So it was, a, it was a site of very heavy contestation. It's back in the news now uh, as, a, as a place, as a, a big hotspot, potentially, with Ru- Russian machinations uh, in relation to that part of the world. So, but, so, I, so I, spent, I spent the best part of a year and I went backwards and forwards. I was, I was in Sarajevo working on the elections as well. Um, but interestingly, John... Uh, I grew up in a place called Hackney in East London, and I lived there for 24, 25 years. And uh, although Bosnia, the place I lived at least, was still pretty war-torn, it wasn't actual violence, but a lot of guns, bombs were going off, that kind of thing. It was a walk in the park, I, believe it or not, compared to my childhood growing up in Hackney, which was really quite something as well. There's a lot, you know, it's kind of very inner city uh, London. Uh, so so that, that that's a really interesting thing. Um, I think what I took away, and as I've got older, it's become more uh, concretized with me. What I took away from Bosnia, to Hackney, but also to Bosnia, it really underlined this, is um, the value of, of, of how, how quickly civilization can unravel, how, how quickly civilization can unravel. And it doesn't take much. Uh, I did my PhD in counterinsurgency warfare, right? And you had a classic kind of uh, insurgent war in Bosnia. So that the, the war model, essentially, especially in Bridgeco and other places that are heavily ethnic cleansed, is paramilitary forces would go in there and commit various atrocities. And that and that used to push um, uh, people out. That was, you know, the main element of ethnic cleansing, was pushing people out through these atrocities. This used to generate massive fear in people and you push them out. And it really didn't take that many people to do that. Uh, the second thing also about Bosnia is it was the kind of the apogee, if you will, if you will of identity politics. It, and that this kind of ties into the of, of identity politics. That kind of ties into the broad theme of our discussion as well, doesn't it? In some senses, if you think about it, the emphasis on these alleged essentialist categories of identity can then harden. And if we go down that line and we forget our common humanity and what, and what binds us and what joins us, things can go very badly wrong very, very quickly. So, so I took that. So that, that was the thing I took away from Bosnia. Bosnia was a very multi-ethnic um, uh, country <coughs> and, and it unraveled very quickly, very quickly. And it doesn't take much. So when we look out in the West, at least very comfortable, and we look out at the benefits of civilization, the rule of law and you know, sort of uh, cohesive institutions and certain sets of norms, those things really are. Um, very precious, very fragile, and they can unravel extraordinarily quickly. So when we play with these matches, like children, you know, play with these matches and throwing them around, as, as we, we might come on to later on, uh, it can get, it, it can, it can, it can go badly wrong very, very quickly. So I think that was that was the thing I took away from Bosnia that the, the precious value of the things that we take for granted, like air, but when we don't have it, things can go badly wrong very, very quickly. Well, thank you for that. I mean, I can't think of a better launching pad to to launch to go to than to that to go to the second thing I wanted to raise with you. Some foundational thoughts on the nature of our international order. You've um, said, and I'm quoting: "The world order is not natural. It needed to be built, and it needs to be carefully maintained." And you go on to ominously say that liberal world order is far from inevitable. Uh, and uh, I think you'd say the same actually of, uh, of democracies like ours, they're gardens in a jungle. Uh, and you talk about identity politics. Well, that's probably the norm. And as we retreat from how we created the garden, which was by cooperation instead of uh, competition, even with people that we our neighbours, as G.K. Chesterton said, uh, we're told to love our neighbours and love your enemies, and often they're the same. And that we learned to do that in our cultures. And now we're dissipating it away. But I digress. Um, you make the point uh, that um, the liberal world order uh, is far from in- inevitable. Um, can you describe what you think a liberal world order is? Because we've lived under it for a long time, but people don't stop and focus on what a blessing, what it is and what a blessing it is. So what do you mean by it? How has it been achieved? Uh, well, it's a, it's a good question, and it's a very it's a massive question. I mean, essentially, the liberal world order refers to um, the, uh, the emergence, ultimately, of American power 
after the Second World War. Yeah. Um, and essentially, so what you had, you had the, the United Kingdom, the Great Britain was the kind of the preeminent hegemon, if you look, if you will, within, within the international system uh, prior to the Second World War. Although the interest in the, the American economy had overtaken, this is a very interesting point, by the way, the American economy had overtaken the British economy by 1870 already. So obviously, yeah. when we talk about, for example, the rise of China and these other kind of things, there's no natural progression necessarily from economic primacy to security primacy and you know cultural primacy. So that's a very interesting point. So by the 1870, the Americans already overtaken Great Britain, but it took two major world wars. And then the kind of it stumbled on post uh, Second World War, you had the, the Greek intervention in the Civil War, for example. And then 1956, the Suez crisis was really underlined. But the, the baton for world power, if you will, passed out fundamentally from the, the, the former co- European colonial powers to the United States. So the, so the liberal world order really refers to this, the, the, the kind of the institutional architecture that was created and sustained by American power in the post-war international system. And it refers to a number of things. First, obviously, is the kind of the, the kind of the economic model. So, it, it, broadly speaking, American planners, along with some Brits as well, Mainyard Keynes, for example, when they looked at the, the accelerants of the Second World War, how do we how do we account for the rise of racist Nazism in Germany, and and the horror of that? One of the major accelerants of that were, were forms of economic nationalism. So in the face of the, the Great Depression, etc., many of the great powers, rather than remaining open, closed themselves down, so kind of become more autarkic or economically nationalist. So, 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 the, so the economic model that guided the post-war international system, the liberal international order, was one of economic interdependence. And the idea essentially is if you create these dense webs of economic linkages, you pacify the, the, the logic of, of interstate rivalry. So it's, it's one of the main ways in which you counter the, 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 the classic law of the jungle realist logic of international relations. If states trade with each other, then essentially they're, they're far more disincentivized to go to war with each other. If that if that makes sense, so that so that was a so that was a kind of, that, that kind of open economic model was a really interesting element of the the, the, the post war international system. And then the the other one was obviously the inter, in, institutional architecture of it. So you had the creation of the various Bretton Woods institutions like the United Nations, etc. And then you had security co-binding as well, so various security alliances that, that took place. So, for example, NATO, the US-Japan Security Pact, etc. So you had these various elements of the international, uh, liberal international order that were thrown up as a result of American power in the post war international system and kind of continued, but in the context of the Cold War as well. So that's the kind of broad architecture of the liberal international order. And then obviously within it, it had certain kinds of norms. So liberal democracy, for example, the rule of law, et cetera. Um, so that, so that's, that, that's the liberal international order, if you will. That's the sort of standard take on the liberal international order. It has lots of critics, obviously. Um, uh, uh, and it's, it, it, it's kind of been um, differentially applied geographically. But but that but so so essentially so therefore then you had economic interdependence between um, the Western states at least security co-binding amongst states through through various alliance systems uh, and then certain sets of norms within the liberal international order itself and so 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 and but that was also predicated on American military power if you think for example at the end of the Second World War. The European powers were kind of largely industrially broken, again, underlined by the the failure of Suez when the Americans told the the French and the Brits and the Israelis to get out, get the hell out of of Egypt. So that was really underlined there. Um, So but but, but, but the liberal international order was was uh, really based upon American power essentially, you know, as, as the key hegemon within that international system, which then leads to a very interesting question, doesn't it, insofar as as we see the rise of China, as we see America's relative economic decline, what what does that portend for the liberal international order? If, 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 if its institutional architecture, if the will of its to, to sustain it is predicated upon American uh, power in, in, in terms of its capacity to create institutions, to underwrite institutions, to solve collective action problems, you know, and, and all these kind of these issues that bedevil international relations. If the US sinks down or goes down, whether it's as a result of its relative economic decline with China or whether it's as a result of it just sort of gives up the ghost, 
you know, you know, people, if you look at a lot of uh, elite commentary now, there's talk even of like a, a new American civil war and potential secession between red and blue states in the US. So, I mean, that doesn't necessarily portend well for the maintenance of American hegemony. Uh, so, so I think I, I, that's a kind of like a, a roundabout way, I think, John, of answering your question. Um, but, 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 but that, but the, the final point I'd like to make is that isn't natural. Uh, if you think, for example, about European geopolitics, I mean, for it, it, its norm is one of, of great power competition, offshore balancing and war. So the liberal international order many, in many ways has solved a lot of problems with international politics, but it's tied ultimately to the will of, of the Americans. And if we buy the idea that America is in decline, what then does that portend for the future of the West and the future of the liberal international order? Yeah, I, it's worth reflecting on this for a moment, isn't it? Because what you've said, I think, is very powerful and incredibly important, but not understood. Uh, we all love to hate the Americans. Uh, you know, uh, it, you see it everywhere at the moment. And people often do it so thoughtlessly until there's a crisis. And then where are the Americans? Um, you can't, as you, one of your former prime ministers said when he was here in Australia, Tony Blair, there's no major problem confronting the world. It can't be resolved without the Americans being uh, engaged. But to go back to what you were talking about, in contrast, it was not the natural way of doing things. You look at the end of the First World War, you could sort of see a broad pattern of identity politics, you know, uh, you will pay because you opposed us. How dare you oppose us? Um, the United Nations failed because uh, there was a whole lot of retributive sort of attitudes and policies put in place. After the Second World War, the extraordinary generosity and far-sightedness of the Americans to say to the Europeans, who were in a worse state a couple of years after the Second World War than they were at the end of the war, everything broken, people starving, I mean, just an absolute mess in much of Europe. The Americans came in with $13 billion US at the time in the so-called Marshall Plan, so it wasn't just military. You can think of Berlin Airlift, that was military. But economically, here is a whole lot of money if you'll break down those trade barriers that you were talking about, if you will cooperate economically. And it provided the carrot and sufficient stick for Europe to emerge as a peaceful bloc, by and large. So that was a massive force for good. Then you look at Japan and the... Um, the, the efforts uh, led by MacArthur, by the Americans there, not to pay out, not to destroy. And given the way the Japanese had behaved, and that was felt very deeply in Australia towards uh, its people, it's still felt in China. What the Americans did reflected a great generosity of spirit. Why do I labour? It's to emphasise what you're saying. It's not the natural order of things. It's not what human beings normally do. It requires a rising above, a, a, a believing in a real vision for a better future and asking the hard questions, do you get there through cooperation or through competition a la identity politics writ large or writ small? So it was good policy thought through, I would argue not without compassion, backed up by enormous military might all seem to be in short supply or shorter supply, as you've said. Um, is it possible, let me ask you this question, to maintain that liberal global order as a philosophical thing, do you think, without the threat or possibility of violence? Um, it's a great question. I mean, I guess what you're saying, and I, I completely agree, is it, it matters who wins big wars. The domestic norms of whoever emerges victorious uh, will affect ultimately the, con the kind of international order that the victors then or the victor then constructs, right? It's a, it's a really important point. Think, for example, if Hitler had won the Second World War, he would then have had an opportunity to construct a particular type of international order, right? Uh, which would ha have had a very different inflection to the type of international system that the US constructed. So, so I, I completely agree. I think it, I think it really matters who wins major wars, um, uh, and 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 the and the kind of international system that that, that that they then go about constructing. And your your question was um, about the philosophical nature 
of of and and and, and identity politics in 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 the US now. Uh, so, I mean, I think that um, can can the liberal international order sustain itself uh, in 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 this context of what does feel like a far more fractured uh, Western in, international system? Um, and I think that that is uh, um, uh, a key question in in terms of if we think, for example, about the. Uh, um, the, the capacity of the West to sustain itself in the context of the this kind of increasingly strong forms of identity politics, um, and what we see now in America is 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 this the, the emergence of this identity politics and and the kind of impact that that's having on on the American capacity to, to maintain the international system and the liberal international order. Yeah, well, uh, wokeism. Uh, look. You're awakened when you see that the world is for what it really is, uh, I suppose you'd say, and critical race theory is perhaps the high point of that. Uh, And before we come too much to the cultural side of it, it's worth making, I think, elaborating a little on what you've said. I'd be interested in your further views here. Uh, Can a country as divided as America, and let's be fair, all Western countries are now divided, we're all polarised, we're all tribalising, not least of all Australia, it worries me enormously, uh, we, we seem to be unable to see the things that should unite us, that we have in common, uh, the, the things that will endanger the most important things for every one of us if we can't stop focusing on the things that divide us. And so you now have an American government where the transport minister, who was a, you know, a, a, a under consideration uh, you know, as a presidential campaign uh, for the uh, candidate, uh, who's um, made sure that one billion US dollars out of the trillion that's been dedicated to new infrastructure will be spent on making sure that new roads are uh, uh, not sexist, that they're gender fair. I don't know how a road, I'm not sure how that works, can be sexist. Uh, You have a a vice president who's asked if uh, satellite uh, uh, information gathering technology can be deployed to work out how many trees there are in various neighbours neighbourhoods, so as to assess the social justice of uh, the, the numbers of trees and parks that people have in various areas, these sorts of things seem only uh, sure to further divide, further distract, further weaken, and one wonders whether you're left with a culture that believes in a bigger vision in the way that America once did. It's the very point you're raising. I suppose I'm really just reinforcing it. Yeah, I mean, I think that if we think, for example, about um, the Cold War, America emerged from the Second World War as the preeminent military and financial power. Uh, And as you've just mentioned, you know, set about creating a kind of broadly economically interdependent international system, the liberal international that, that was underwritten by uh, very concrete security guarantees, so NATO, for example, the US-Japan Security Pact, etc. So it had these things, and then obviously, then the end of the Cold War, uh, we entered into a different uh, a different period, one of uh, uncontested American unipolarity. But obviously, we now have the rise of China and other powers, other challenging powers, revisionist powers that seek to revise the international system in ways that they consider conducive for their national interests. Uh, or, or their status claims as well, uh, and then we have a uh, the US, obviously, which is facing extraordinary difficulties, and as you, and as you, you've mentioned, a kind of um, a, 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 an elite discourse now, uh, wokeism or wo- whatever whatever you wish to call it, which kind of um, uh, sort of emphasizes uh, division, and um, uh, and has a, a very kind of a negative. A view of uh, history, a very contested view of history, but one that's put out there as the, as the kind of the dominant way of, of interpreting American history and Western history, and one that I think that is fundamentally antithetical to um, key core civilizational values that have allowed the West to sustain itself, in particular, Enlightenment values, a commitment to equality of opportunity, equipment, uh, equipment, uh, a commitment to equality of all before the law, reason, science, etc., um, so, I, so, I, so I think I think this kind of this new dispensation that we're seeing growing now uh, in the West, this 
woke wokeism is a shorthand for these kinds of uh, issues, if you will. It, it is leading to, I, I guess, um, a kind of a, a lack of civilizational purpose or civilizational will, I think, on the part of the West to sustain itself. But for me, the most in- interesting question is how do we account for it? That, for me, is, is, the, is, the, is the most interesting question. I mean, um, you know, we, we've had, I mean, there are various theories about how we account for the rise of identity politics. Um, and many people argue it's a form of neo-Marxism, you know, this sort of, this kind of idea of neo-Marxism. I would say, for me, it's more, it's more a kind of, um, it's, a, it's, it's the failure or the end point of a kind of, a kind of hyper-liberalism where this kind of constant emphasis on, on the individual coupled with uh, the uh, prevalence of postmodernism in 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 the university system, in particular, which is which is very much places a very strong emphasis on the contingency and the relative nature of knowledge, uh, and therefore everything is about um, knowledge claims and emotion and identity. And, and we've had we've had this very very strongly in the university system for a very long time. Um, but but the interesting thing is how these ideas have, have gone from the petri dish of the university system and now gone mainstream. You know, you you've have major banks, major corporations endorsing this. And so I think for those that care about the future of the West and that care about equality of all before the law and reason and some of these core values that, you know, that are absolutely fundamental to Western civilization, I think the bigger question is how have we seen the emergence of these ideas and the these ideas have now become an almost ruling elite ideology that that pervades the co- the, corp- the corporate system the political system etc i think that for me is is the is the key idea uh, and one, once once you un- once you begin to get a handle on that and begin to understand that then you unravel it and sort of how then do we begin to move away from these these very divisive ideas Yes, well, I, I, uh, I note that you recently wrote, and I'm quoting again, woke politics is a new form of status-oriented class war more akin to a secular theology than a program of political transformation. It presents a story of moral certainty, sin, guilt, and deconstructive redemption through the erasure of Western culture. It's as though they are determined to build down what remains of our cultural home. The great problem is they can't point to a better home for us to move to. It's very nihilistic in that sense and therefore very chilling because, again, I think in your writings you reflect the reality that that once these sort of woke theories, which are so intellectually and morally and even spiritually flimsy, hit the hard steel of economic or military or geopolitical crisis reality, They'll evaporate like a, a, thunder, a thunder, a summer thunderstorm. They'll be gone, and all that will be left is utter misery, as we've seen in times of devastating revolution in the past. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought that when the pandemic kicked off, I thought, look, this is an awful, awful thing. But at least one thing that will happen is it brings home the reality of hu- of human frailty in human life. And so, you know, the the, the idea is that obviously the, 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 this kind of new woke ruling ideology is a, is a kind of dalliance in, in many senses. It's, an, it's a kind of dalliance. It almost represents a sort of ci- civilizational fr- frivolity. But in the in the context of the pandemic, where real life and death issues are, uh, will face us, it will at least disappear, and we can begin to you know move forward on a more unified and a, and a, and a less divisive basis. But that didn't happen. That didn't happen at all. Um, I think there are various reasons why it, it hasn't happened. I think I mean I think obviously you've heard of, of this kind of you know, the Trump derangement syndrome. And I think I think a, a lot I think a lot of the so-called progressive left, and I say so-called progressive left, have really uh, so going back to the point you just you just raised about kind of a, a status and a kind of class war. I, I kind of I, I, I interpret a lot, a lot of the woke um, uh, 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 stuff. It's a kind of in many senses it's a failure of globalization in some senses, or or it's a failure of the last thirty years. Of 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 this kind of the, the, this kind of the, the dominant model. What what we've seen, I think, this is how we also explain the rise of Trump in the U.S. and 
Brexit to a lesser extent as well. What we've seen ultimately has been a sort of change in the political economy of the of the Anglosphere economies, at least, where there's been new winners and losers in this new dispensation. Globalization has been extraordinarily good, uh, kind of uh, building up the top, the top one percent in the U.S. in particular, and then offshoring of jobs, and then and then you've seen an incredible rise of an East Asian middle class, so that you know the rise of China, WTO recession, etc. So, so this then has changed the, the, the domestic politics of, of the of, of America, but also of, of of the UK, which also followed very much down this this very strong sort of uh, change in in its economic system, and it's been incredibly powerful in many senses. But it's left new winners and post industrial wastelands, new winners and new losers within that. So, and so I think I think that I think that the rise of woke politics is partially explained. By the, uh, the 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 response of the the new winners of globalization, the big corporations, etc., they want to keep the show on the road. So what so what they do? You've heard obviously of the classic thing of you know the idea of virtue signaling. So Apple or Ben and Jerry's or these major mega corporations can ultimately virtue signal. So the Twitter Twitter CEO can write a ten million check. Ten million dollar check to uh, to you know the sort of one of the chief theorists Ibrahim Jandi I think his name is in in the states or so these corporations can pay lip service to these woke identity politics issues but it keeps the show on the road nothing actually really changes do you see what I mean so so and, yeah. I, and I think and I, so I, so I, I think that that's I think that partially explains it it's about corporate virtue signaling uh, around issues that are very easy 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 to do. You know, you can sort of. I, so I think it's partially that. I think it's um, uh, uh, also interestingly. I think it's also we've we've really seen the woke thing take off in the uh, anglophone, um, sort of, in particular, sort of Protestant <laughs> or, or, or secular, you know, post secular, sort of secularized Protestant um, uh, countries. And I think I think this this goes back to this idea of it almost being like a religion, a kind of a new secular religion. If if we scrape the surface away of of the claims, the sacralization of alleged uh, 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 repressed minorities, uh, the the inherent sin and guilt of the West, the need for self-flagellation, the the original sin of whiteness, all this stuff is taken exactly. For, it, it, it's essentially a kind of form of religion, and that's why when you, when you try to engage with it on a, on the level of rationality and reason and facts you either get an incredibly strong response or you 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 get the rejection of facts and objectivity and truth as inherent tools of 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 oppression you see what i mean it's so it's operating almost on on a on a religious faith script you just have to believe it so i think so i think and i think that also speaks to something deeper in our culture where i mean you know we're very comfortable very very comfortable we have incredible levels of economic development in many senses but so so it's kind of there's there's a kind of sense of uh, loss there's what then fills it what's what's the what's the sense of purpose or, or sort of you see you know what i mean what, what's the what's the teos why do we exist so, so i think that that feels that to quite a large extent the third element obviously is, is a reaction against trump and to a lesser extent a reaction against brexit in the us so-called the liberal left really see these things as the emergence of white supremacy or the, the, the development of this new dawn of fascism i think i think that the uh the the, the, the so-called progressive left have kind of operated the, the moral steam that has driven them forward for so long has been this endless narrative about the emergence of fascism. So, you know, so what gives them almost their own moral purpose, and it's a very much a moral script, is this kind of endless uh, assertion that, that that we're just we're just the advent of a new fascist storm. You see it very strong with Brexit in the UK. Constantly, you know, it's, it's, it's apparently it's a new quest for empire, and you know, Boris Johnson is leading a you know, like the most multi-ethnic cabinet in I think in British history. It's, it's it's kind of a it's racist and sexist and homophobic. Do you see what I mean? So, see so all these things kind of come together in this in, in this in this mix that I think helps explain um, uh, wh wh why we are where we are. But but as your question alludes to, and I think 
this is what I think the key point. We are in a very different place now in the West. So whilst we can play with these ideas and we can reject the Enlightenment tradition, we can eject, reject equality of all before the law, we can seek to undermine Western civilization and castigate its history as one of endless litany of oppression and darkness. We have in the wings the rise of some of the most authoritarian, uh, totalitarian states in human history. And given where we are technologically, the capacity of those states to uh, to darken human life is is almost beyond you know measure. So we're, so we're at a very very dangerous place to sort of try and bring this package together. If the liberal international order in the post-war international system, underpinned to a large extent by American power, but also other um, states like the UK, Australia, and, you know, and other, other states, right, has, has, has led to very complex forms of economic interdependence, a set of uh, international norms, not always observed, but mostly observed, the rise of incredible economic wealth that's been distributed across the globe. I mean, look, for example, now about where we are as a, as a human race, where, compared to where we were 60 years ago or 50 years ago. It's led to these incredible advances in, or, in human progress, right? Um, but, but, but we seek now to sort of tear down this, that, that civilization in this fit of, of identity politics, but waiting in the wings. Russia, for example, right now is weaponizing refugee flows vis-a-vis -vis Belarus. China is pushing constantly out. It's seeking sort of territorial, extraterritorial expansion constantly. Um, so if we tear down the liberal international order, if we tear it down, right, what then uh, will, will be, what will come in the future? bearing in mind that what we've had for the last 70 odd years has not been the norm in human history. It's very precious, very contingent and very fragile. And it, re it, it requires constant reinforcement. Yeah, you stop, you stop this, the reinforcement of this thing and the, the, the game changes fundamentally. So that, so I think that the, the geopolitics of identity politics, the geopolitical element of this is, is arguably, I think, one of the most interesting elements of where we're at in relation to Western politics. Yeah, I'd like to tease out a couple of issues um, there that you've, you've raised in my mind. One is, as a new religion, I've got to say it's particularly unattractive because... Um, there's sin all right, and there are high priests telling us all what's right and what's wrong. There are a couple of things <laughs> that are seriously missing. There seems to be very little love, certainly not for your enemies. And redemption seems to require our own self-destruction, which is not exactly loving either. These are massive shifts. I mean, in many ways, it's important to understand the religious history of the West because there are many ups as well as downs. So you had the horrors of burning people at the stake for daring to disagree until people realised it was not Christian, it was barbaric and it was also dumb. Uh, and we started to learn to live with one another's deepest differences. That is unique. It is not what most people down through the ages and even on the planet today experience in their day-to-day -day lives. But it's being dissipated very rapidly. If you dare to disagree today you will be somehow shut out of human discourse. You are less than human. So it is very ugly, isn't it, at a personal level. It's very lacking in love. In the, It talks tolerance. It talks empathy. It talks inclusion. It talks diversity. In reality, it's very ugly. Yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it is very ugly. I think it is very ugly. Um... And I, I kind of, again, it's it, it, it's almost, it's it's why would you do that? For a start, most of those that are driving this forward are actually, uh, in my opinion, white white upper middle upper middle class liberals, right? So I, I think I think there's an elision there between um, this idea that you're seeking some kind of form of, of like amorphous social justice. It's a way of almost 
uh, dealing with your own privilege, you know, you're, this constant um, idea of white privilege. Um, so, I, so I think it, I think it is quite ugly. And uh, and then I, I also don't. I think it's also very dangerous. I think this is one of the reasons why I've, I, you know, I've kind of got written about this quite a lot because what we have in the West is a broadly very very tolerant. Um, society, very progressive and tolerant society. If, if we look at opinion polling in the UK, for example, it's one of the most tolerant anti-racist societies in, in history. I mean, the, the EU did a massive poll, I think, in 2019 uh, of, of public opinion across the whole of the EU. The UK pretty much came out on top. I mean, we've got a very sort of, we've got a mixed um, uh, race population, very multi-ethnic, multi-racial. Uh, so, so, but then uh, but that, but that, that has taken a great deal of effort and work on the part of ordinary people to arrive at that kind of, you know, broadly multi-ethnic, multi-racial thing, and it, and it and it requires reinforcement. So when so when you have people that come along and say, you know, talk about white privilege, especially in the context of um, when you look at the data on some of the most privileged groups in society, it's, I mean. Take my sector, for example, university sector in in the UK. Um, that the most un, un, uh, disadvantaged group, and this has been going on for a very very long time, at least a decade. The most disadvantaged group in the UK university sector are white working class men, in particular. And universities have known about this for a very very long time. Okay, white working class men are the, the least likely to go to university, and if we believe that universities are a, a kind of an engine of of of, of, of uh, uh, equal opportunity. That's a, a structural reinforcement of disadvantage for white working class men. That's a very very established fact. That's not controversial in any way. Right? And what what have universities done in the last two years about this? What they they've gone hyperdrive on picking up the this kind of this critical race theory ideas, talking about white privilege and white fragility. And it, uh, so it's something I think very, very morally obscene in that we have very clear data. Uh, we, if you look at on a per capita basis, uh, ethnic minorities are massively over, over represented in the UK university system, especially amongst the student body. I think I think it was Oxford uh, last year took on 33 percent of all of its new undergraduate intake were, were drawn from um, uh, ethnic minorities, which is a great story. It's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's you know. But so 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 we have so yeah it's very unforgiving it's um it's uh it's it it does seem and and then I can't I can't see what the end point of this is it just seems to basically be about a desire to guilt trip people to guilt trip people but but the, the danger in that is what happens when people say I'm not going to be guilt tripped anymore they've been told that they're racist sexist homophobic xenophobic and they've been castigating all these things uh and, and and the danger point in that is what then happens when that if, if people say well i don't feel guilty why should i feel guilty what, where 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 then do you go from that where do you go from that that's that's the question i think you raised uh, the second thing i wanted to say out of out of your last set of responses that i think is really important to to highlight progressives hate reason and data and science, it seems. Uh, and in fact, uh, proponents of critical race theory will tell you, I think, openly that they reject uh, not only all religions, except their own, we've established that it's more or less a religion, um, reason, the enlightenment, modernism, all political systems, philosophy, and science. It seems to me there's a real problem engaging progressives in a debate around facts, around data, around science. I thought our universities, and I think people who pay for them, the taxpayers, thought they were places where you went to establish or as, to get as close as you could to the truth. Uh, and as a very wise, uh, a leading historian, actually, Geoffrey Blaney, said to me in one of these chats recently, People worry about what's being taught in the universities, but don't you think the greater problem is what our children are being taught in their early years at school by the people who come out of the universities? Now, I don't want to sound like I'm down on teachers, although I'm certainly down on some of them, 
uh, and on their union in this country uh, and the way they've organised themselves because they push so many of these bad ideas. But he's making a point. What happens in our universities is terribly important for the rising generation, not only because so many more people go to university, but because virtually every child, if not every child, is shaped to a greater or a lesser and usually pretty significant degree by somebody who's been to a university and they are almost uniformly woke now. There's no contest of ideas. So it's not just a disinterest in facts. There's almost no opportunity for people to put data there because unless you're woke, you, you, you don't seem to have a place in the system anymore. How on earth has that happened? And what can be done about it? Well, I think it's a fantastic question. I mean, I think I think that um, I, I have no problem with people arguing or disagreeing with me or you know, and I think, I think, I think universities should ultimately be about you know this, this contestation. But how how did we get here? I don't want to go too far down the theory rabbit hole for you, or your your audience. But I have to. I'm I'm actually writing a new book right now on uh, the geopolitics of woke and decolonizing in in, in the UK. Uh, and maybe when it's out, I'll come back on this podcast if if you'll be so kind of, to have me. But basically, so uh, uh, the chapter I'm currently working on is looking at some of the theoretical um, twists and turns here. And obviously, I mean, pe- people say. Um, I would say one of the main ways in which we account for it is the dominance of what's called post-structuralism in the social science and humanities. I mean, if you look at a lot of the the woke uh, identity politics stuff, it comes out of this kind of I'd, I'd say it's post-structuralism, which, which itself was a was a reaction against a kind of um, Marxism, which was the the, the 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 dominant theoretical system in the university system for very for, for, for a very long time. So, what are the elements of Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida? In relation to the sort of the post-colonial stuff, Edward Said said, "What are some of the key elements of this?" And one of the key elements of it is its fundamental rejection of this idea of fact and truth and objectivity. It's a fundamentally what's called a, a epistemologically relativist worldview. In other words, there's no such thing as truth. There's no such thing as ont- reality. There's no such thing as ontological ontological reality. Essentially, everything is ultimately about knowledge. And and the, and the way we see the world, this is the key insight of people like Foucault and Jacques Derrida. The way we see the world fundamentally constructs the world. So that thing, so you know, so that thing doesn't exist independently of me. The chair doesn't that you're sat on doesn't exist independently. Ultimately, it, it's it's constituted within a broader discursive system, a kind of system of knowledge, if you will. Uh, so 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 in that in that theoretical sleight of hand, we have then a fundamental rejection of uh, scientific on, uh, uh, rationalism, but also ontology, how we adjudicate between different world worldviews. So everything ultimately then becomes kind of equal. So it's a, a, a epistemological relativism. All truth claims are merely uh, floating out there. Mm. There's, there's no such thing as truth. There's no such thing as a scientific standard, ultimately. It's essentially it's about the contestation of various forms of knowledge. And I think that also, so, so fundamentally a rejection of the Enlightenment tradition of reason, i.e. judgmental rationalism, how you adjudicate between different truth claims. They reject that fundamentally. Everything's just simply about the way we see the world. And I think the second point from that is that I think that then helps explain why we've seen this kind of this the cancel culture because essentially and and the kind of policing of speech and these other things because ultimately words then become violence in in, in the kind of post structuralist worldview uh, that by uh, by speaking by you, you're, you're ultimately you're conjuring up sets of power relationships by 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 the way in which you interpret the world so so I think I think that's been a big part of of how we explain the rise of this in the academy and then broadly speaking when the graduates go through the system this this stuff i mean it's it, it's almost it, there's almost like a sort of what i'd call sort of to borrow a postmodernist term like sets of meta narratives that sit within the heart of academia that almost just form the kind of the presumptive bedrock of so much of, of what then takes place in terms of research you know, so essentially, it's the, the the hegemonic common sense, if you will, of academia. So that the West is fundamentally, irredeemably bad and wrong. Okay, its history is is one of characterized by injustice, uh, etc. Capitalism is is fundamentally um, bad and wrong and exploitative. America 
is a corrupt and uh, 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 evil country. Uh, you, you, you see what I mean? So you can go and so and so that that kind of almost forms the presumptive bedrock of that what then takes place within within the university system. Um, and so I think that 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 partially explains uh, uh, helps to explain and and there's no pushback against that as well. This is this is the key as well. I mean, if you have those ideas and they're well argued and you know that's fine. But 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 the, the um, but the, there's there's kind of almost a monoculture in academia where there's no there's so little contestation of those ideas. And then I think the the key thing for me is when those ideas have then been taken up by university administrators as we've seen in the uk context for example so many university administrators and you must have heard the famously about stephen Tooper at cambridge who's just recently resigned etc but it's very common amongst vice chancellors uh, and those that are actually in power they've often adopted these ideas um, and then begun to sort of percolate them through the system and impose them as a new orthodoxy. So not only do they form the kind of hegemonic common sense of so many academics, sort of uncontested back backstories that just exist and are just commonsensically true, but they're not they're radically, radically contested. But then we've also got the enforcement of, uh, of these ideas as a new orthodoxy by so many university leaders. And then more broadly within Western culture now, so the corporations have adopted these ideas, etc. You prompt me to ask whether perhaps there's not a concerning parallel with another great era of self-doubt on campuses, that of Britain in the 1930s. It's often said that Hitler, and I think Churchill certainly believed this, was greatly encouraged by the resolution at Oxford in what 1933 or 34 uh, that I would not die for king and country. I think that was it. Uh, that young Britons would not risk another war in their own lives to defend the things that Britain supposedly believed in. And some historians would argue that that encouraged Hitler to believe that the West was decadent and had lost its way, it wouldn't stand up for itself, and turned what should have been just a series of ugly little border skirmishes that were shut down and resolved by uh, people who were committed to peace and understood the dangers, uh, into uh, you know the mess that was the Second World War and 60 million people died one way or another. Is there a parallel to be drawn? I noted in Australia that when uh, uh, we criticise ourselves as uh, such a terrible place uh, and what have you, it's often then channelled in the China media. There's a lot of very hostile remarks in them. Chinese media about Australia today, uh, they don't have to invent their own criticisms. They, they just pick up uh, some of the commentary they hear in our own country. Um, well, how do you think China really sees the West and how much more dangerous is it making the world if it's true, as I believe it is, that they think we are in decline, not just in economic and military terms, but in terms of, if you like, civilizational belief? <laughs> Well, again, it's a massive question. It's a fantastic question. I think that uh, my take on China is obviously it, it has weaponized the the culture war element. It, as you said, I mean, you read the Global Times, it's, it sort of picks up these themes. Um, and there's no doubt that it's it's weaponized this. It's in, in terms of social media, bots, cyber cyber stuff, etc. So you're so you're so you're definitely seeing that. Um, but I think my take on China would be, uh, I think that given the pandemic, uh, I think that they've most probably overplayed their hands. Uh, they've overplayed their hand. I think they've made some big mistakes um, in terms of the way in which, for example, they've castigated Australia. I think they, just, they spoke about the sort of Australia's the bubble gum on the shoe the so-called was it uh, uh, wolf warrior diplomacy stuff like that um I, I think that china's an interesting one because obviously it's right you know in your neighborhood and we, we've had the AUKUS uh, announcement recently uh, australia for the last couple of years has been buying all kinds of really interesting um kit from the americans uh, so obviously australia has become far more concerned about the rise of china and then obviously we, we, with the pandemic, um, it's it's become sort of a, 
it's it, it, it's it's become far more uh, a kind of a sort of hostile neighborhood, if you will. Um, but I think that I, so I mean I think that China has definitely weaponized these identity politics narratives in the West. Um, and I guess the, the the main question is if we kind of continue down this very divisive divisive path, uh, do we have the will necessarily? to stand up to these kind of uh, sort of totalitarian and authoritarian uh, 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 regimes. Um, so and I think that's that's the key. That's the, really the key question, isn't it? Do, do, we, do, do we have the will to do that? Um, I, I think that, I mean, I know that you, I, I, China, I think, is in a very tough neighbourhood. I think that uh, uh, China faces a kind of sets of strategic dilemmas in 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 its sphere of influence or its neighborhood that i think um mitigate against uh, uh, in in quite significant ways uh, we can we can talk a bit about that if you, if you wanted to john i mean and my what my what i think about that um but i i do think that um uh china is in a very tough neighborhood i think it obviously shares large land borders with major powers um it has to rely on uh the sea to get its energy into its in into it although it has developed other uh it diversified its energy supply somewhat uh with pakistan etc um and then and then also obviously china is surrounded by uh states that are very worried about its rise and therefore, the balancing capacity against China is very strong, uh, and, and 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 the security alliances against it are, are very very strong. So China, in some sense, if you think, of, for example, about America, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but obviously, it has these two massive moats either side of it: the Atlantic, the Pacific. It doesn't have to worry about its neighbors in the North, Canada, or Mexico. It doesn't have any of those kind of major existential strategic dilemmas that lots of other countries have and the whole point of geopolitics is how one's foreign policy and in particular security policy are dictated by one's geographic location so the u.s has a really nice uh geopolitical in terms of its actual existential in uh, security the mainland whereas china is in a much more contested zone as i said it shares major land borders with uh, russia with uh, India, I mean, and, that's, that's, and then obviously surrounded by states that are very worried about its rise. And it's it had historically many, many wars with, I mean, Vietnam, I think, I think it's about seven wars in the last couple hundred years. I think I think in Japan, et cetera. And all of these states are very worried about its rise. So I think China is in a very rough neighborhood. I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, and also we have to bear in mind that the, 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 the relationship between economic power and military power isn't just isn't just a one way street. That doesn't mean China doesn't have designs, extraterritorial designs. It clearly does. Um, but I don't. But uh, but but even then, if you look at China, uh, as uh, I mean, I think I think it spends about thirty five percent of its um, security budget on internal policing, on internal security, domestic security, and stuff like that. So so I think I think China is obviously very strong. It's militarily extraordinarily strong. Um, but I think it is in a very rough neighbourhood, and, and I think the capacity for security alliances and wedging strategies to take off would, are quite strong. Uh, and, I, and, and obviously, that that speaks to some extent by, to the AUKUS deal, uh, to the AUKUS relationship that we've seen recently, um, and those kind of things. I think a, a broader frustration might be the uh, lack of seriousness. Or at least, in, if, if we if we take uh, GDP spending on on defence and national security by states in that region, so for example, I think Taiwan, even Taiwan, I think spends under two percent of its GDP on yes. its on its on, right. on its military forces. Japan, almost unforgivably, one, one could argue, spends I think even less than one percent, or just nibbling around the one percent mark. So all of these states are very, very reliant upon the U.S. ultimately as their primary hedging strategy against the rising China. And I think that these states should obviously begin to sort of spend more and take 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 that fund more seriously. So whilst, whilst Australia is, is in a very, very rough neighbourhood, 
I, I think that the there are significant mitigation mitigating uh, elements to uh, China militarily. Um, we can talk more about that if you want and go into that a bit more if you wanted to. Yeah. Well, there are lots of issues, but one I'd like to touch on is we've been talking about, uh, because I think there's a certainly a, a, a reinforcing one another's prejudices here, that the lack of belief is perhaps in our own culture is perhaps the West's biggest threat or the biggest threat to our freedoms. Um, some might say that AUKUS is a clear indication that we do still believe enough to do uh, to form some remarkable alliances. I certainly find it encouraging. Um, it must, uh, it, it certainly seems to have irked the Chinese. The question is, will there be the willpower in my country? I hope so. In your country? I hope so. In America? To carry that sort of thing through. You have the Quad, which is India, Japan, Australia and America. Again, the Chinese don't like it at all. It's worth remembering that Lee Kuan Yew, that great statesman, he was, of course, of uh, that very ethnicity himself, warned 20 years ago that it would only be in unity that China's neighbourhood, people in the neighbourhood, would stand any chance of not being picked off one by one in the future. So you are seeing that coming together but again, uh, we've just seen a, a motion by the Students' Representative Council at the University of Sydney, our oldest university, uh, by an overwhelming majority, a decision passed uh, to um, uh, abandon military spending in this country uh, or virtually abandon it and spend the money on health and education. Uh, we've seen the Greens in Australia declare that uh, New Zealand, which I think spends less than 1% of GDP on defence its navy, I think, has two frigates, uh, uh, is, is the gold standard in defence forces and that we should do the same. So again, it, it comes back to this question of willpower. Do you think AUKUS marks a significant turning point in your mind? I'll come, I mean, the interesting thing is a lot of this stuff that we've spoken about, and we, it's, it's such, been such a fantastic broad-ranging conversation, we know, from defence to identity politics, geopolitics, liberal international order, right? But I think a, a lot of this stuff comes down to may, maybe this kind of idea of luxury beliefs, you know. The Student Union at Sydney can, can say these things because the, the consequences of, of their, their beliefs have no impact upon those expounding those beliefs. And I think, and I th and I think that that, um, so, so I guess the, 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 que the question really then comes comes down to um, uh, if the state if, if the chips are down, what would happen? Um, uh, and I think if you look at uh, opinion polling in the UK, um, it's very very strongly uh, you, know, you know against. I think there's a very strong feeling against because of this constant repetition of the kind of national repudiation we see in our dominant media. And I think we see a lot of that because it's very London centric and it goes back to some of the kind of issues I spoke about before, the kind of catastrophization around Brexit, the kind of dominant narratives that have been ultimately sort of formed the bedrock of our social science humanities um, in, in the West, but in, also in the UK. So I think you have all that. But I, but I do, but I, but, but then, as you say, we have seen the concretization of the secu of security alliances, and AUKUS being one of them, which then speaks to this kind of, this broader move, doesn't it? In relation to the, the beefing up of a, a kind of security alliances in 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 the kind of, in the age of a, a sort of I, I guess I think you had Niall Ferguson who spoke spoke about the new Cold War Cold War 2.0. So 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 I think I, I think we we are seeing concrete moves to, to towards that. Um, but then, but then it goes back to this question of like, uh, or how, how then do you begin to tie it together? So I think AUKUS is definitely a big part of that. Um, but then even then, that's an interesting set of debates because on the one hand, obviously the UK is very heavily involved with that and it, it, and it kind of speaks to this kind of natural historical affinity between Australia and the United Kingdom. But at the same time, in, in relation to global security, is that necessarily the, bit, the best place for the UK. I mean, I, 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 for, so there are obviously big strategic debates about that as well in relation to well, what does the US want? If the US did what did get involved in a potential conflict situation in, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, then the UK at least 
East, obviously, as being one of the sort of preeminent military powers in, in the European in the European geopolitics, would it necessarily be best placed in also getting involved in that, or would it would it be best placed in terms of concentrating its 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 uh, its capacities in relation to Russia? Because the big fear, will obviously, would be if if a, if a conflict uh, or a low level conflict, ideally, did kick off in the Indo Pacific vis a vis China, potentially in relation to Taiwan or, or those kind of issues, uh, given that the U, the UK is so far away, etc. Would it not be best placed to sort of concentrate more on Russia and potential Russian aggression in the East? You see what I mean? In terms of you, you could mm. Russia could take advantage of, of of a potential conflict situation in the Indo-Pacific. So e, e, so even in sort of defence thinking in the UK, there are there's sort of these kind of mixed strategic you know dilemmas. We saw that the Integrated Defence Review 2021, which talked about the Indo-Pacific tilt. But at the same time, we have Russia now um, a kind of, uh, you know, sort of gearing itself up. It's currently on the borders of Ukraine, amassing significant uh, military capabilities there. It did the same thing last year, then stood it all down. You see what I mean? so, so Russia's constantly kind of nibbling at that. Um, what I would say, perhaps is one, one way of doing it, it, it would be to sort of significant efforts to try and solve the Russia problem in the context of European security. I think that would be a major push forward, which would then allow more attention to be placed on, 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 on China. And, and then he, in terms of Russia has its own national security interests. It's, you know, it's, it's against NATO and all this kind of thing. So maybe potentially a kind of big push on solving the Russia problem uh, in in some way, so it's not constantly an irritant on the edge on, on Europe, pushing at the boundaries and Balkan tripwires and Ukraine and uh, etc. To try and solve that problem, in which case then the, the the kind of the Western alliance can sort of put more attention on on the China issue, and even then, it's how then do you begin to incentivize China away from con- conflict path dependencies and conflict dynamics towards sort of more peaceful uh, coexistence? How do you do that? And so there are different ways of doing it. And obviously within international politics, forms of economic independence, the classic realist versus liberal position, isn't it? In terms of, you know, you've got the the, 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 the conflict dynamics and security dilemmas and balancing behaviors, you've got that, that kind of stuff going on versus economic, the liberal argument, economic independence. So I think that's what that's what the Obama thing was about, the TPP, and then the, the newly re-energized TPP. Is that a way of kind of helping to sort of shape the regional contexts of the of economic independence in East Asia, and therefore lessen or dampen the logics of, of geopolitical rivalry amongst the various states. Doug, we could talk forever, uh, and I hope we can talk again, perhaps when you release your next book. But um, uh, you're plainly doing everything you can uh, with very considerable both talent and verve uh, to, uh, uh, you know, establish the importance and to carry forward the importance of very solid scholarship and debate. Let me ask you to perhaps round out our conversation uh, uh, by referring to an interesting aspect. You talked about Neil Ferguson. He's just recently endorsed uh, the University of Austin, a new university uh, with a stunning lineup of people who are associated with it. Uh, There's some real horsepower there. Because, as he says, the old university seemed beyond redemption. Uh, without buying into that particular debate, I'd just be interested um, uh, on, on how you see the best way forward. Because plainly, we need to equip as many of our young as best possible uh, for the emerging global realities. Uh, the longer people are allowed to live in sort of some sort of delusional torpor about global realities as though the only thing confronting us is climate change. We don't even go there to simply make the observation. There are many other challenges. I mean, the one thing I'd say about global uh, um, uh, warming in this context or climate change would be to say, I can't imagine how you'd ever get any cooperative progress if the liberal global order we've been talking about breaks down. I would have thought that would be a total disaster And yet many of the people who are activists on climate change seem to be determined, the same people who are determined to destroy the liberal global order. Uh, But back to the heart of the question, um, 
what's the way forward uh, if we're to equip young people, the leaders of tomorrow, enough of them, uh, to uh, actually be able to do that job? I, I can't say too much, but I've been quite heavily involved in uh, debates in the UK uh, around questions of academic freedom. Uh, and we have, I think, given the level of intensity that we've seen in the UK university system, where uh, vice chancellors and senior university leadership teams have come out and openly endorsed very, very contested ideas, very, very contested theories and impose them on the, from the top down as a new kind of orthodox, orthodoxy. It's kind of a creeping illiberalism and a creeping authoritarianism from the kind of mandatory imposition of unconscious bias testing and um, the open endorsement of ideas around microaggressions, which literally it's a direct quote from the EHRC, which is the key body uh, involved in, uh, in in making sure equality law is is, uh, is is carried through in our public institutions. They spoke, for example, about a lecturer's body language and demeanour. So that's where we are now uh, in the UK university system. Literally, uh, my my body language or my demeanour, if it's interpreted going back to post structuralism, if it's interpreted. The emo emotionally, it's you know, in, in seen in a certain kind of way, that is indicative of of my oppression or my racism or my kind of you know something or whatever. But, so that's where we are now. So we've had to fight a rearguard action. So I've been I've been involved uh, in quite heavily in debates on academic freedom, and I've also been involved with a small group that's helped to sort of to some extent guide uh, the academic freedom legislation that is currently going through the UK Parliament as we speak. Um, so I've, I've been involved, very, very heavily involved in that, and I think, and I think we've, so that we've had to fight a rearguard action. If, if the waves have been crashing across universities, um, campuses for quite a while, and it went on steroids in the last couple of years, so we've had to sort of almost fight. I was, I don't want to get too kind of um, flamboyant in my language, but it's almost been like a sort of a counterinsurgency campaign against. This creeping illiberalism and authoritarianism, very informal, very ad hoc. No, I mean some support, uh, but but you know it's we had to scrabble around and pull informal alliances together to, to sort of try and help to sort of guide and shape the academic freedom legislation. So I think that's been a key element in terms of attempting to safeguard precious and contingent values in the UK education system to create a beachhead, if you will, upon which dialogue and civility and respect and reason can re-establish itself. I think that's been a really important thing. So we have now the academic freedom legislation going through the UK Parliament. Once that's passed, then we'll have what's called an academic freedom director who will work directly in the what's called the Office for Students, which is the university regulator, who, who, who can oversee and ultimately uh, sanction universities if they don't respect um, academic freedom. So, so I think I think that's a kind of a major salvo. In some sense, a major battle has been won in terms of defending uh, or, or carving out a beachhead upon which that level of academic contestation and those precious values can sit backed up by regulatory power. It's not my preference to have the state intervene in that way. Uh, I'd much rather it from the bottom up in terms of just um, academic values. But unfortunately, that's not where we're at because of the mono, largely monoculture we have in academia. But then the, the, the tipping point for that has been the adoption of these ideas by university administration, the imposition from the top down. That was the tipping point. So we have that going through. And then I think we have, as you said, the Austin in the new university. So may maybe we'll see more market diversification in the UK and in the ang anglophonic world in general. I mean, at the moment, we do have various universities in the UK that are ranked in certain kinds of ways, et cetera. But maybe, uh, but, 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 but in terms of the marketplace of values, they're very much all monocultural. You know, it's kind of uh, uh, very, very, very much kind of. So, may, so maybe we'll see um, uh, if I were a, a, v, a vice chancellor right now, I would come out and I'd say we are going to place our institution at the forefront of championing 
uh, enlightenment values of equality of all before the law, reason, science, and these precious values. And we're going to take academic freedom very seriously. That's, that's what I would do and come here and you're going to get a highly critical, rounded education, not monocultural, diverse, uh, a, a kind of a di diversity of opinion and ideas and, and really inculcate those kind of values. So, may so maybe we'll see new market entrants like this in the UK, like we've seen with the University of Austin. Maybe some university vice chancellor will get ahead of the curve on this and really capture those values. So, so uh, I've, I've answered your question in quite a long, long form way. But there has there have been under the, under the radar there have been the kind of the efforts of of a very small number of people to really try and shape and defend these precious values in the UK and shape the policy intellectual and cultural matrix in a way that defends these values. It's been a long effort. There's still lots more to do, lots more to go. But uh, but I, I think that that's been a, a a major battle has been won on that front and and to and to that extent the uh, the government have been really uh, good Fan they've, done a, they've done a fantastic job and my hat hat off to the D Department for Education uh, and the teams there and the, the small group of people that I've worked with on on those efforts. Well, you've been very generous with your time. As I said before, we could talk forever. Uh, and I hope we do have that opportunity again. Uh, but uh, we should wind up for now, I think. And I wish you all the very best and uh, hope I haven't robbed too much of your time. Not at all. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, John. Thank you so much for your time. Did you enjoy this episode? We cannot get good public policy out of a bad debate. If you value vital conversations like this one, please like, share, subscribe and join the conversation.